Hi everybody, how are you today? It's a wonderful March day. The Ides of March are past and Caesar didn't get killed. And uh, Heather Cox Richardson wrote another really great thing about um, it's the anniversary of Maine becoming a state. And apparently Maine had a lot to do with the abol abolition of slavery. And she tells a wonderful story about it, which I read again this morning. So now we are, uh, which is wonderful, because uh, Heather Cox Richardson on Substack. If you want to relearn about American history, and for me, many things I learned at first sight, please do read that. Meanwhile, we're back at Wisdom is Bliss, Four Friendly Fun Facts That Can Change Your Life, by me, Robert Thurman. And we, um, but uh, I'm giving sort of, in this book, my view of Buddhism as an education system, as a sort of science. And uh, Buddha's uh, teaching about our ability as humans to come to understand reality is couched in form of a curriculum, of an educational process that we have to undergo in order to achieve that understanding. And um, it's not like just something we can believe something, uh, and then that that will give us the understanding. Um, understand our English word kind of has a authoritarian flavor to it. That um, that um, knowing the nature of things involves agreeing with someone who tells us what that nature is, indoctrinates us, so to speak, and then we understand. We stand under. Uh, that uh, scripture or that uh, authoritative statement or whatever. And Buddha's thing was different from that and because he rebelled against the authorities of his time. Some of them. Not, not all, I mean, the, the culture was a very fine culture and he liked it compared to other human cultures, but he rebelled as far as its ultimate bearing on the nature of reality. He decided he did not really understand the nature of reality fully. And therefore, he felt he had to rebel against it and come to a real understanding of it from his own experience. Sort of like modern scientists who decided to break from the church, from the Inquisition, from enforced belief and indoctrination, and observe nature and see how things worked, analyze them, take them to pieces, see how the parts fit together, and then from observing reality, come to have a knowing of it. And in the Buddhist case, uh, in a way, experiencing it, you know, personally, and in their case, experimenting and having experimental conclusions. Excuse me, you'll have to cut this moment here. <coughs> For some reason, I suddenly became congested, I guess, the, the stress of speaking. <laughs> I wasn't before. Okay, so that, so we are at the so that's what the then then in the four noble truths, the four friendly fun facts. The first two are diagnosing the situation that we're in as as sensitive beings, who are too often in pain. We suffer too much, and in fact, on Buddha's point of view, uh, even our temporary moments of relief are suffering because we know they won't last, and we're afraid. We we, we sort of pipe that we don't really enjoy them because we know they're going to come to an end. So we kind of, we, we, we smother, we strangle our enjoyment of pleasures by wanting them to last and, and being dissatisfied with them because we know they won't, or by comparing them to some better way they could be while we're experiencing them and therefore, um, you know, d depressing ourselves about the, the experience of them. And so... Um, so to get away from living like that, he gave a prognosis about our suffering state and said we can actually really be happy. That's the third friendly fun fact, that the actual nature of reality, that the human reality within reality of, of a life on this planet is such that if we learn how to do it, we can actually be happy. We can enjoy things. We can be well. And, and in, if we are happy and well, even blissful, then we're able to help others that way. But that gives us the strength and the energy and the skill uh, to be able to help others find that themselves, actually. 
But nobody can give it to the other. Only we can coach them. We can encourage them to put themselves through a sort of training, an education, basically, which includes training. But it really means being open to experience and then fully going into it and having the help of people who analyze things before us, pointing us in the right direction, but finally we have to do it ourselves. Isn't that fun? That's why friendly fun fact. And friendly because these are happy people who are friendly to us unhappy people and want us to become happy. Now, the first two things we did, just to recapitulate, uh, it took us a long time, although it's only about uh, 50 pages, a little more than 50 pages, but we did the two first lanes of the path to the nirvana, freedom from suffering, the happy life, in other words. And that, those two, one were realistic worldview, which basically is an acceptance of causation and an openness to experiencing reality and coming to deep more experience it more deeply. So an openness of mind basically is the realistic world. It's not a closed, clenched belief. It's an openness of mind. If there's a little bit of belief that maybe a little clenched, it's like, okay, maybe I think some things just happen by themselves or they didn't or they're just the way they are because they're like that. But actually, I sort of will accept the discovery of scientists, not just modern ones, from ancient time, Buddha as a scientist, and other great, great what they call rishis in India, and in other cultures, seers, uh, that um, uh, they gave good methods of how to educate myself. So I accept that. And so that's a realistic worldview, that we, when we have that worldview, about the nature of relationships and the nature of openness. People usually say emptiness, and that gets people scared, and they don't know what it is. But it's like that the two too easily can be conflated with the modern view that the basic reality of everything is nothingness. And emptiness doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean a void, a vacuum, where there's nothing. It means every solid thing is also empty, because empty means it's empty of any non-relational element. So everything is completely interrelated. And there are vacuums within that, and there are solidities within that. And they're both equally emptiness, and they're able to relate to each other because they are free, they are open of being some sort of absolute thing that cannot relate to anything else. Okay? So it's really very simplistic, actually. Very easy to understand. Relativity. Not exactly the form of it that Einstein came up with, but Einstein was heading in that direction very strongly. Therefore, he made us very ripe for this for this understanding. Okay, realistic speech. Now, we're not, So we did the first two. Then the second one was, once we have a realistic worldview, that means we're sort of open to the fact of our vulnerability. We're open to the fact that we're not happy. We analyze our, our things that maybe we think, okay, if someone asks you, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, we'll say. But then when we really think about it, maybe we're not so fine. We're upset about Gaza. We're upset about our own pains and problems. We're upset about other people's pains and problems, Ukraine, Gaza, anything, anybody under a dictator. We're so unhappy about their fate. And um, so we come to realize that. And then we realize, though, by being open, that it is possible but because in order to come to a realistic worldview, we develop critique of unrealistic worldviews. And so we don't have fanatic, dogmatic faith in any particular thing, including we don't have fanatic, dogmatic faith even in causation. It's just that we're open to observing causation. And we realize that by default, things do happen from causes, and that they cause other things. And so because we're living in these streams of, of, of causation, that's how we live. So then we are open to the fact that in case what Buddha suggested to us is that there is no limit to that process of causation, we then realize that we are cause, causal beings. Our mind has results from causes and our body has results from causes. Our body is a result of causes. Our mind, in a way, is a result of causes. We recognize that as we gain experience in life. But then what the Buddha, as a scientist, teaches us 
which is very useful here, is that there's no limit to how good we can get, how amazing we can develop our potential, what our, how enormous is our human potential, in other words. We can be something really super normal, we can become, we can develop, you know, like someone, if they become uh, have an ambition to be an Olympic athlete or a professional sports player or some professional musician or something, they really aim for Carnegie Hall, they aim for the NFL, they aim for the Olympics, you know, and they don't, someone says, oh, you can't do that, that's for somebody you see on television. Well, you, some, if someone, incur a coach encourages you, you can do it, you have the talent, you can develop it, well, then you decide you might want to do that. So Buddha tells us we have the, the talent as humans to understand ourselves and the world. And when we do, and we shouldn't accept anybody telling us we can't. And because when we do, we're going to be really happy. As long as we don't, it's, it's unsure, uncertain whether we'll be happy or not, because we won't know whether if we do this, it will make us happy. If we do that, it will make us happy. It's like if you don't know what food is poison and what food is nourishing, you might eat the wrong food, and then you become poisoned. I mean, that's just simple stuff. So once we get this idea that we can become all-knowing, we can become fully understanding of our thing, and that's when we'll be really happy, we then get a realistic motivation. After the realistic worldview, we then are encouraged to come up with a realistic motivation. We get very gung-ho. We notice that one of the most best moments of our life is when we understand a new thing. We get a new advantage over things because we understand how they work. So we get a real pleasure from understanding something more about whatever it is. And so that that can be developed limitlessly gives us real encouragement. And we decide to alter our priorities in life and try to maximize our ability to evolve as a being, not just acquire more things or knowledge or experiences, not only that, that also can be good in a way if we're observant about what we do, but also acquire a greater knowingness, expand our kind of beingness, a greater lovingness, a greater knowingness, a greater happiness. We're going to develop that. That becomes our realistic motivation. So then once we have that realistic motivation, we then decide how to proceed, and in the Eightfold Path, we decide to add another lane, and this is kind of surprising, because, <coughs> you know, we have that expression, speech is silver, speech can be silver, but only silence is golden. We have this kind of, uh, this uh, truism like that, I think, comes from ancient Greece in, it, in the West. And, uh, the idea, that's a good, actually, uh, saying, because what that indicates is that language has limitation. Language is, can only reflect facets of things. It can't really encompass the full reality of something, you know, because it's a binary. It's yes or no, black or white, up or down. It's very, it's binary. It's, it's kind of simplistic in relation to the complexity of things and phenomena in the world. So, so language, even a poet, can evoke an experience, but it can't capture the whole of the experience. They just can give us a new facet that we didn't see before, and that's why we love poetry. But no language can completely capture things, and no, including the language of mathematics. Two and two is four is a facet of any object of which there can be two and there can be four. <laughs> it's not some sort of abstract thing, a two and a two plus a four, like, out there flying around the sky. That's, it's not like that, although people tend to think it is, but it isn't. However, and therefore, people expect an enlightened person to be silent. And that was the case in ancient times. The word muni, like Shakyamuni, uh, in the name Buddha took as a Buddha, Shakyamuni. The Shakyas was the people he came from, the Shakya clan or the Shakya nation, or the Shakya tribe, or whatever you want to call it, a kind of city-state at the time, like Athens, you know, Shakya. But he was the Muni of the Shakya. Muni means a sage, and it has a connotation of a silent sage. So he didn't speak because 
he was one with everything that he experienced. And he realized language couldn't really convey what he experienced. So he doesn't speak. That's what the sage does. On the other hand, the third path, the Eightfold Path, the third lane of the highway, is realistic speech. <laughs> Contrary to that idea, a realistic speech. So that's that's what we are chapter four in the in the Wisdom is Bliss book is on realistic speech. Because speech is what we have to um, encounter in a new way to evolve. Because in spite of the fact that speech cannot capture ultimately the nature of reality, speech does give us reasonable approach to that ultimate nature. And therefore it's immensely valuable. It is an incredibly amazing thing. You know, we humans are social animals. We are mammals. We are when after we are conce we are conceived by two parents, usually, or the eggs are sperms of two, even if they do it in some technical way where there's only one host or something. But we are produced like that. That's our causation. And then uh, we we are we live inside the body of the mother for some period of time, and so far, I mean, they do have test tube creatures. So they will probably have more in the future, but normally we live inside the mother's body for ten lunar months, nine solar months, and then we're born outside. And then, but then we're very dependent. We're helpless as infants. We're dependent for a long time on other beings, and. Um, until we're 50, some people say, <laughs> which I didn't believe. I did, so I kind of broke away from my family quite young. But that, that is a possible thing. Okay, so so now we come up, uh, and, and what is it, how do we communicate with others once we're not in their body anymore? We talk to them, and we listen to them, all right? And we and they discover what we our perspective is, and we discover what their perspective is. And this enriches our our experience of the world and life, in that we can we can we can share other people's experiences of the same things we experience, and therefore learn much more about them than we could just by looking at them ourselves, in a, from our normal separated perspective. So we can we can aggregate many many other perspectives. So speech is immensely valuable, and realistic speech is the third thing. So let me read the way I did it in the book. The first two branches of the eightfold path. Real, realistic. Well, actually, cut. I'm going to cut. Real. Okay, back to work. Okay, whenever you're ready. So, to start reading chapter 4, page 53. The first two brand, realistic speech, after realistic worldview and realistic motivation, life purpose. So, realistic speech. Now, the first two branches of the Eightfold Path, realistic worldview and realistic motivation, constitute the higher education in wisdom. Remember I told you there's three higher educations in these Eightfold Paths. Education in ethics, education in mind, which is in psyche, which includes meditation, but it isn't only meditation. And education in wisdom, which is the analytic observation of reality, the scientific exploration of reality. It's what wisdom, wisdom is when you really know the reality. It's knowledge that is experiential, put it that way. Okay, so um, so the first two branches, realistic worldview and realistic motivation, constitute the higher education in wisdom. This is the scientific exploration of reality as we experience it, and we transform our experience by understanding it. To activate the third branch of the path, we move from the super-education in wisdom to the super-education in ethics, which requires us to learn more about how ethics connects to evolution. So, uh, it's interesting, speech does connect to ethics because speech is interactive with others, right? You, can, you think that, well, speech is just the words I'm thinking in my mind. But there, I wouldn't have words to think about in my mind, my inner monologue, as you could call it, if it wasn't that I learned as a child to speak to others, and they learned to speak to me in particular languages, and I could understand them, and they could understand me to the limits of our ability to understand. And, uh, and so it's the beginning of interacting with others. 
And if you interact with others, then ethics is the proper way to interact with others. It means to to interact, optimizing your interaction with others, ethics means. Not harming them, that means, and being helpful to them, ideally. And at least not harming them. So first of all, we have to acknowledge the evolutionary power of speech, words and language, in order to use them to reshape our lives along with others. The three path branches constituting the super education in ethics are realistic speech, number three, realistic evolutionary action, number four, and realistic livelihood, number five. So these three are the higher education or super education in ethics. And so we're beginning that now. Why begin with realistic speech? Because good evolutionary actions begin with learning. The realization that actions are evolutionary in their causal impact on oneself and others mandates one's choice of livelihood. Ultimately, all eight branches of the path must function simultaneously. Their order of presentation emphasizes a best sequence of approach, but they are not rungs on a ladder where you step off one to get onto the another. They are rather like a symphony. You add one instrument at a time until all are playing harmoniously together, and each one comes into its fullest power only when combined with all the others. Or the other one, I would say, I like to say sometimes, it's like a multi-lane highway. But it's a multi-lane highway where you you expand your vehicle, so eventually you're on all the lanes. And that way you have the biggest, most stable vehicle as you go down that highway to the nirvana, to the enjoyable life. Uh, then the sub, they give a subheading. My editors did, they gave me a subheading here. Scientists, politicians, artists, and educators. <laughs> in, many, in many discourses, trying to make it easier for you to get through my writing, in many discourses, the Buddha describes realistic speech as speaking the truth and avoiding falsehoods, speaking diplomatically, reconciling others in their disagreements, and refraining from divisive speech, that is to say, speaking speaking divisively to make others against each other, instead of speak diplomatically to reconcile them with each other. Backbiting, which is, a, you know, divisive speech, slander and backbiting, but you do that in order to divide people. You slander them and you backbite them. Then speaking meaningful, speaking sweetly and pleasingly and avoiding harsh speech or abusive speech, right, by speaking sweetly and pleasingly. And finally, speaking meaningfully, because beings are seeking meaning. Human beings are, live, are meaningful, like to live meaningfully. Actually, all beings, all animals live meaningfully. For the lower animals that don't have speech of the same level of ours, meaningful to them is, fee is getting food you know, and surviving, be not becoming food of someone else. That's meaningful. And avoiding senseless chatter. So those are the four, those are part of the tenfold path of positive and negative evolutionary action, which is where you have, like, you have ethics of body, speech, and mind. So here in realistic speech, you have those four in the middle between body and mind. This sort of middle zone is the speech zone. It's kind of interesting because that's where we, when we live in the speech zone, when we are part of a culture, a language, we live between ourselves and others. We live in a space between ourselves and others. When we're in our mind, we're sort of inside ourselves in the normal states of mind. And when we're in body, then we're separate from others. We know we're, we're responsible for our presence as a physical object to others. So those are the four ones, you know, speaking the truth, speaking diplomatically, speaking um, sweetly, and speaking meaningfully. And so those are, those are the four good kinds of speech, and their opposites are lying, being divisive, being um, abusive, and being um, meaningless. You know, none of these four types of realistic speech is fanatical, since one should not use truth to cause harm in certain situations. 
In other words, you know, if some bad guys are chasing a nice person and you know where they went, but the bad guys say, where did they go? You don't tell them you lie and you say they went out of the other way to save the nice person. But that's that's a good good speech there, although it is not true. So, in other words, everything is a little bit situational. One should not be diplomatic unless we'll help the others involved. Sometimes it's better for people to actually oppose each other, for you know, to work out something better. Should not flatter people who are in error or misbehaving just to please them. And should at least withhold meaningful speech in a situation where you know someone will misunderstand it. As in all things, pragmatism is essential. Speaking truth is what scientists are dedicated to doing. They investigate reality and must try to report on what they find, or at least what they consider the truth. Good scientists is always self-cautious, knowing that often when they think they're right, they may not be. When they think they've got the right insight about something, it may be only some perspective and maybe not so from another perspective. So they're very careful. Actually, a good scientist has to be a good philosopher. Materialist scientists are not necessarily <clears throat> trained well in philosophy. They're trained in mathematics. They're trained, so they, they should be trained in logic, therefore. They're trained maybe in chemistry or in, you know, in, in data and so forth, things like that, and in theories that other people have developed by past experiment and the history of experimental, how theories came to be. They're, they're historians, in a way, uh, and they're analysts. But they're not necessarily good philosophers because that's, that's not necessarily considered necessarily part of their training because the materialistic dogma-controlled science thinks that the nature of reality has already been discovered and it's just material objects in a field of nothingness. And objects being both atoms and energies in, in a field of nothing. And, and that the ultimate reality of everything is nothing. <laughs> and they think that's a discovery. But actually, my big deal nowadays is you can't discover nothing. So therefore, it actually cannot be a discovery. It's only a dogma. And that's actually a really important idea, philosophically, a very, very important idea. It doesn't come as a result of objective observation and, neutral, you know, impartial observation to decide that everything is nothing. It's a, it's a misuse of language. It's a confusion. It's a philosophical confusion. Speaking diplomatically is the focus of peacemakers those who seek to help others improve their relations with each other, serving humanity in that way. So, you know, you, you know, there was, when, why, why do we sometimes backbite people to turn them against each other or slander them to get others to be their enemies? Because we think, well, in case they're our enemy, we want more people to ally with us against them, or in case they might be partners against us. We want to alienate them from each other. So uh, we have motives like that to be divisive. And But actually, the way human communities are, from Buddha's observation, ultimately, if everybody is harmonious with everybody else, that's the goal. So in the meantime, you can help others by making them harmonious with each other and avoiding their conflicts, helping them avoid being in conflict with each other. So that's that's quite good. Peacemakers those who seek to help others improve their relations with each other, serving humanity in that way. Speaking pleasingly is generally good for one's own relation with others, and the sweetest speeches are the creations of artists, poets, playwrights, novelists, musicians, bards, and singers. And that's what I always wanted to be myself. I wanted to be a novelist and a writer and a playwright and um, I somehow became a, a scholar, academic scholar, but I've always really wanted to be. And I do occasionally write poetry, and that's when I'm most happy when I do that. And then I did learn music, but then I bagged it. I, I, too bad. I just to play baseball. I stopped practicing my violin. <laughs> Never mind. My mistake, my mistake as a youth. 
Speaking meaningfully is best for everyone to do, and especially the responsibility of educators. Okay, I did that one. That's a wonderful, wonderful profession, helping others come to understanding. As long as you don't get all brainwashed that you're so smart and you can then indoctrinate them, that's no good. But to help them develop their ability to understand things themselves, and then they, when they get the pleasure of understanding some new way, having a new ability, and, and, and participating in that and enjoying seeing that happen, that is such a privilege and such a wonderful thing. So I don't regret being that, actually. Although ultimate, ultimately, if I could do like Milarepa or Bob Dylan, where I could educate people by singing to them, that would be ideal. But that wouldn't go over too well in academia. <laughs> Usually, if you gave your lectures by singing, not necessarily. Anyway, those who help others because become more realistic by sharing reality, dharma with them, insofar as they have some deeper experience and knowledge of it, to share. So, uh, so meaningfully, sweetly, and speaking sweetly and pleasingly, like Taylor Swift or something, that's wonderful, Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell. Okay, so, and meaningfully is to educate them, that's really good. So speech creating connection is the next heading. Speech is the particularly human, deep way of interconnecting with the minds of others. When you talk and I listen, I open my mind to yours, letting your thoughts direct my attention. When I talk and you listen, you do the same for me. When we read, when we read the recorded speech of people from the past, we share their minds. And when future generations read our thoughts, we share with them. Thus, each of us has the responsibility to be wakeful of what effects we are producing in others' minds when we speak. And when we listen, we also have the opportunity to enter into others' experience of things we cannot experience ourselves. Isn't that true? So we really expand our being by being beings of speech, actually. Amazing. Just press the no. Oh, I, I, I. Okay, never mind that. Just, uh, you can't see it. It's, I should have put it out of the room. Somehow Nina must have gone outside. It's over on the table there. Yeah. Just press no. You know, off, yeah. Keep it next to you in case it rings again. Oh, thank you. Um, speech should be only truthful. It should be only peacemaking. It should be only gentle. And it should be only meaningful. Babbling meaninglessly or harshly or untruthfully or to make people enemies with each other, those kinds of speech are really harmful and negative actions. When you listen to someone... They have the privilege of being in your mind temporarily, and they should not abuse that privilege by talking rot. They should try to help your mind. When you speak, you shouldn't invade other people's minds and speak a bunch of nonsense and rot and lies to them and, and distress them even more than they've already been distressed. Speech enables us to learn and thereby to evolve to grow into wiser, more experienced, more realistic, more capable, and happier beings. Learning new things may even be the essential purpose of all living beings. Essential to the quest for true happiness in any one life, in any one life, and along the range of limitless ongoing lives. And of course, this is, you know, we're not getting into this fully, but we will in the next chapter. But the whole idea of this life only or multiple lives, I think I did deal with that in <coughs> the worldview section, but I can't stress how important it is as the real takeaway. You know, I always think of Oprah when she fell in love with the teaching of uh, Eckhart Tolle, who I also, whose teaching I also love, with his The Power of Now. And when she sort of got that, it made her suddenly feel that she was in the present, at least sometimes when she focused her mind that way, 
in a different way. She wasn't the way we can be, where we rush through every present moment because we were anticipating some future thing. We're after it. We're going to get there. We're going to reach there. We're going to we're going to do that, you know. And we don't. Therefore, we keep bypassing where we actually are, which is in the present. Even though, in a way, maybe we're not. Maybe there's no exact thing called the present, but there's a. We begin to look at the present in a different way. That's my point. And you be more, bring it more vivid, be more to life, be more aware of what's around you in the moment, and what's within you in the moment, what's around you in the moment. So she just, she, she said it was like a moment of where the earth moved. You know, I think that expression comes from Hemingway's, you know, from making love. You know, when when the love making is really great, and somehow, I think the female had the feeling as if the earth moved, or maybe the male, maybe they both did. I forget the passage. For whom the bell tolls, I think, in that novel of Ernest Hemingway, he's, he's thinking about the earth moving. Well, believe me, when you approach the Buddha as a scientist, when you escape from the this life only theory that modern science, materialistic science, inflicts on you as if it was an absolutely discovered thing and a fact and all this, where you feel entrapped in that only. And even even you like it even because it, it it you think it it's like the power of this life. You don't have to worry about a future one. And you don't have to worry about a past one. You just from birth to death. That's it. That's your only worry. And then and you're nothing. But actually, there's nothing scientific about that or realistic about it. It's just a dogma. And I'm not asking you don't have to believe in some future life. As I told you, all theories are just stories in a way even though some stories fit better the evidence, and you adopt those, the ones that fit better. You don't ask for absolute certainty before you follow a story. You know, so, and it doesn't grip you like a fanatic thing. It's only this story. That's dogmatism, and that's not scientific. So uh, to say that any law of nature is only hypothetical because there may be discoveries of new data, new facts, new causal processes, new levels of subtlety, new macro levels, new micro levels, where you will realize that what you thought was the case is not the case, and you have a deeper view of things. So there seems to be no limit to that. But my point is that we came from nothing, just some seeds of our parents, and then we suddenly decided that we existed, and maybe when we were three years of age or two, or when we got off the tit, or whenever people think that happened, or when we were born out of the womb, you know. Then suddenly we thought we were a separate person. So that's the beginning of our consciousness, which is an illusion, because we are not anything other than our body, supposedly, according to these people. And then we, we grab our way around with the material elements of our, uh, that our material body runs into, and we deal with the fact that we don't feel we're only a material being, or we have this imagination and this mind, but that's an illusion, we're told. And that illusion goes away when we die, when the body dies, when the brain flatlines, when the heart stops beating, when we stop drawing breath. Then that's it. That's the end of it. And this means that we, we do not accept causal process because our having been here didn't cause the nothing. It's just kind of a discovery that we've always been nothing. And the body stopped deluding us that we exist as a, as a being, as a continuum of a being. That's, that was a delusion. But the point is, that's not a discovery because no one discovered nothing. Therefore, it's not a scientific fact that your process of your mind can become nothing, just like your body doesn't become nothing. You, you die, the body rots or it's burned, it becomes thermal energy, it becomes, you know, like a bacteria or whatever. You know, it becomes other kind of matter, you know. It never becomes nothing, okay? Because n nothing isn't there. That's what the word means. So therefore, it's just a dogma that you don't have a future su subjectivity. You won't have future consciousness. And that's just a dogma saying that you're just produced as an epiphenomenon of your brain makes you think you exist when you don't really exist. And even Buddhists agree that some scientists who have read a little superficial Buddhism will say Buddhists agree. They say that you don't exist. You have no self. You're not really there. But the Buddhists that no self, unfortunately for them, 
is not stupidly conflating it with the discovery of nothing. It's just simply saying that you don't have a self the way you think you have a self. But actually, you do have the selfless self. <laughs> a more interconnected self. That isn't some sort of absolute separated thing. But it's still a continuum of being a self. All right? So that's really important. So... Learning new things may even be the essential purpose of all living beings, essential to the quest for true happiness in any one life and along the range of limitless ongoing lives. Human beings, angels, titans, and gods are distinguished by speech. We humans live and evolve in speech, not only physically and mentally in body and mind, but spiritually and ethically. Speech has a central role in shaping reality, body being shaped by mind and mind by speech. Through speech, we individual humans can expand our self-identifications to become communal beings without necessarily losing a sense of individual responsibility. That is a mouthful. Through speech, we individual humans can expand our self-identifications Okay, I identify as as Bob. That that's my name. I identify as a alive. I identify as a human. I identify as and not dead, alive and not dead, human and not an not another kind of animal or a angel or a god. I identify as American. I identify as a male. You know all these huge structures that we impose upon ourselves. I consider that to somehow that structure to encompass our identity. But we also know that all of that is changeable. I cannot be alive, I can die. I can become animalistic and be reborn as another kind of animal. Even as a human, I could become a psycho and decide I was a, uh, like a butterfly or a bird. People, I could go crazy and think that that's what I am and that other people are making mistakes when they think I'm human. I think you can probably find them in some insane asylums. People who actually think they are some kind of other animal. To identify that way, in other words. So, but through speech, we individual humans can expand our self-identifications to become communal beings. So I am a relative of so-and-so. I'm the son of so-and-so. I'm a, we even have it in names, you know, in many cultures. I'm a this and a that, you know. I'm a, I'm a member of this team. I'm a member of this family, you know. To become communal beings without necessarily losing a sense of individual responsibility. So just because I am a family member of this family, or I'm, I'm a human, or I'm an American, or I live in, I'm a Woodstocker, or whatever it is, I, can, I still am a separate person in my structure. Okay? But none of those things are absolute. There's no, I have no absolute self-identity. We're going to disc we only find that out. In a way, a language like Bob, that would be, so I'm not Joe, I'm not Adam, I'm not Henry, I'm Bob. If you say to me, Henry, this and that, I'll look behind me for it, see where Henry is. You know, I will, it will, it'll go right past me. But if you say Bob so-and-so, then I react because I think that's my identity. So because it's a single word, then we tend to think that we have some single fixed thing that the Bob lands on. Actually, there's millions of Bobs, you know, and they're all different. So Bob is not an identity, actually. It's just a name. So, so we can identify, however I can identify as Bob, I do. But I don't lose a sense of my individual responsibility. As the great Tsongkhapa said in his Enlightenment poem, The Short Essence of Good Eloquence, which is what, a, what an enlightened being, there tends to be a tradition of they might write some statement that when, how they see the world. Although actually in the case of Dzongkapa, when he was 41, he had this experience that he felt was the experience of complete clarity, complete comprehensive understanding of the, real, of the world and reality. He felt he did. And um, he sort of allowed the world around him to crystallize into an institution celebrating that. He did that. And he wrote a poem, and then he found a school, and all these kind of things. Uh, but um, uh, he said, of all in that poem, one of the things he wrote, 
of all the Buddha's many deeds, and here he's thinking of many Buddhas, but and particularly at that point he was thinking of Shakyamuni Buddha, who was about 2,000 years ahead before him, and whose teaching, however, had helped him come to this amazing experience that he had, sort of super bliss experience of where he felt identified with all life in a blissful way, and yet was completely empathetic to the living beings that he identified with as not being super blissed out, suffering a lot, and therefore he felt fully compassionately connected to them. But he did that because of receiving the Buddha's teaching, but he was thousands of years after Buddha's time. So he says, of all the Buddha's many deeds, their deeds of speech are the supreme. Because from what he said was people recorded and they handed down, it was translated from Sanskrit into Tibetan or Prakrit, you know, whatever local language Buddha spoke. And then he read it and he understood from that. So he's very grateful about it. So he says their deeds of speech are the supreme ones. For this very reason, the wise applaud the Buddha for their speech. So that's what they really appreciate about a Buddha, is what the Buddha taught. They don't. They, they like that he existed, he was a being, he had a body, he went around and did this. But really the greatest thing that a, someone does is their teaching. When they share their, which is in other words, access, allowing other beings access to their way of understanding the world. Because that is a way of understanding it that supports a blissful being. So they won't accept anybody less than a Buddha. That's what he's saying. So words shape your thoughts is another little heading. In the most high-tech, advanced, esoteric ways, speech actually controls how we shape our bodies and minds, even bodies. Speech at its most poetic and powerful becomes mantra when it liberates the mind or controls the mind. Mantra means liberate, but also has a sense of controlling. So, for example, you know, there's this thing that people do. They say they have affirmations. Was it there was a funny Saturday Night Live uh, skit where somebody, I forget the name of the guy, he would look at himself in the mirror and say, you know, you're really quite amazing. You're really great. You, When you do something, it's really good. And you can always really rise to any occasion. And you really do well. And you're marvelous looking, by the way. And you this and that. In other words, giving all these affirmations to himself in the mirror. <laughs> and then you feel really, and you really deserve to feel really <laughs> And then the idea was that it made him feel good. But actually the reason that that was a funny skit is that it does make you feel good. And if someone always puts you down, it doesn't make you, it makes you feel bad. And of course flattery is, I, have, I had one friend, a famous artist, who used to say, flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> you know, the usual saying, flattery will get you nowhere. But he used to say, at least in the arts world, Flattery will get you everywhere, he used to say, as a you know, a little bit sarcasm, but maybe realism. And for example, a coach. That's one of the functions of a coach. You know, before the game, they get there with the team and they go, okay, we're going to get them. Right, right, you know, all right, go. And everybody claps their hand or they all put their hand in a pile, you know, and they pound on each other's fists or something. And then they charge out onto the field, you know. So you can do it, you know. You can get them. Go after the quarterback, you know, do this, do that. You know? There is the pump up, you know, or Henry V's speech. You know, once more into the breach, dear friends, you know, He's sending people to their death in the battlefield, you know, but pumping them up with speech, precisely. That's shaping their bodies and shaping their attitudes and their minds, actually. Supposedly one of the talents of a leader. And therefore people who shape people's bodies and minds in a bad way can have a, if they, especially in the megaphone reality of our media, they can distort people's minds really badly. And they can, you know, you have Hitler, you have Trump, you have Putin, you have, you have people, you know, using propaganda to create really negative mind states in the mob-like aggregates of communities. It's really worrisome. Anyway, and um, there's a very trenchant commentator that I like to read on Substack called Dylan, and, and Medium rather, not Substack, a Medium, called Dylan Kombalik. 
is Ukrainian, and he says that free speech is very under, misunderstood, and free speech is not actually that free, and it shouldn't be. In, in a, it's always in a context. Like, it's like people can't say fire in a theater where people, a crowded theater, in the dark where people will trample each other to run away. And that's harmful speech. And that's not free. You're not free to do that. And similarly, lying about the state of the union or the state of the world and getting people panicked and, or lying to get people to do violence, for example, this is really bad. And so we have to be more rational and more analytical in our preserving our free speech amendment. In the most high-tech, advanced, esoteric ways, speech actually controls how we shape our bodies and minds. Sheep at its most poetic and powerful becomes a mantra when it liberates the mind. That's right, mantra. Manas is the mind. Tra means or like Tara, liberating. Vajradhara Buddha, like if you keep saying, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, you might eventually meet Avalokiteshvara, the Buddhist Jesus, the Buddhist savior figure, the Bodhisattva who is the incarnation of the infinite compassion of all enlightened beings. The idea that the really the real state of enlightened beings is to really find a place of freedom from suffering. And that's really important. So mantra is mantras are really helpful. Uh, Vajradhara Buddha made this famous statement in the esoteric community Tantra, the Griya Samaja. You should create your mind with your body form and your body with your mind form and shape your mind's form with your inner formulation of your words. So the inner, what you, how you affirm yourself, how you deny yourself, how you position yourself, caution yourself, how you encourage yourself, your own inner thought is very, very important in directing you um, to be successful in life. It's really very, very true. Following that principle, we use words to shape our thoughts and our thoughts to shape the physical instruments of our experience. It is thus no wonder that the super-education in ethics begins with the cultivation of wakeful, realistic speech. Speech is, of course... The place where we transcend isolated individuality and live in community with others, as words are shared between minds and meanings are shared between cultures. To emphasize, when we listen, we open to others' minds. When we speak, we are admitted into others' minds. Speech exists inside us, outside us, in between inside and outside, and beyond all such dualities. This shared community is not a new condition of Westerners. In the noble teaching of Vimalakirti Sutra, when Shariputra, the ancient Indian saint and foremost individual vehicle disciple of the Buddha, is asked by the wisdom goddess to tell her how long he has been in what he thinks is his privately attained nirvana state, he doesn't answer, he keeps silent. She asks him, why, venerable elder, you are foremost of the wise, which is one of his names. You know, you're the foremost wisest person in Germany. She says, Why do you not speak? Now when it is your turn, you do not answer the speaker, the question. And then Shariputra says, Since nirvana is inexpressible, goddess, I do not know what to say. Then the goddess really blasts him with non-duality. She then rejects the usefulness of that silence in this case by saying, respectfully but firmly, Venerable Shariputra, all the syllables pronounced by the elder have the nature of nirvana. Why? Nirvana is neither internal nor external, nor can it be, can it be apprehended apart from them. Likewise, syllables are neither internal nor external, nor external, nor can they be apprehended anywhere else. Therefore, Reverend Shariputra, the do not point to nirvana by abandoning speech. Why? The holy nirvana 
is the equality of all things. I really do love that passage. It's a very deep thing. I used to assign students who would read this sutra in a class, History of Buddhism, to write why was Sariputra's silence criticized by the goddess. Because later in a chapter that we'll read, Vimalakirti in a certain other context doesn't answer a question and maintains a silence. But that silence enfolds everyone present and people gain higher understanding from with him not speaking in that context. So silence as, an, as a part of speech in a way, a refraining from speech is a kind of speech. It's always contextual. Its validity or invalidity is contextual. And then the smart ones would realize where she says this, do not point to nirvana by abandoning speech. So what it is, is he is pointing in the sense that he has had an experience of total release from suffering in a state meditated through a meditation, through a, in a meditative state where he feels that bliss is really everything and he is that. So it's a wonderful transcending experience. But then he, then it ended for him. And, you know, after some time in that experience, where it can be very powerful, we call it sometimes the space-like equipoise samadhi. It's like he just went, be, he just felt really floating blissfully, not even in a body, without needing one. And he felt, oh, this must be what they mean by nirvana. But, and, let, and then he stopped thinking and felt tired, he didn't need to. But then after a while, he returned to his body. And he, he returned to the, what's called the aftermath samadhi, which for, the, which for them, for him then, things seemed a little unreal. Because he had this experience as if the one amazing blinding reality was his feeling completely released. And not as a body might feel released when it, when we swim in the ocean or when we float or when we when we when we're doing skydiving or something. We, we temporarily we're ignoring gravity and sort of flying. So really out of body. So he therefore remembers it as if it was a particular place that he reached. Even though when he was there, it wasn't like there wasn't anything else. So he wasn't like in a place. But when he remembers it afterwards, it was like having been in a place. When he left it, before he entered it, it was like it was a place. And then afterwards, he remembers it as if it was a different place. So what you, what you see saying to him is that he then realizes, and when he achieved it, it was beyond him making any statement about a place, non-place, samsara, nirvana, bliss, not bliss. It was just a bliss that erased any kind of language, any kind of perspectives. He felt one with everything. But there was no other things in it. It was like a separated everything. Everything was un became unreal for him. Right? And then he was back. And then being back, he was told that's the dualistic nirvana. Now you're here. But anyway, uh, he, he, uh, he, he didn't know it was dualistic. He just thought that was what it was. So he's me mentally pointing to something that he is thinking the other people will not understand if he talks about it. So he's mentally just pointing to that experience. And that's why she's criticizing him. In a sense, his imagination is withholding the nirvanic state from other beings who he feels are not arhats, are not saints, who didn't achieve that. And he's in, in, a, way, in a way withholding it from himself because he's in a kind of aftermath condition of, well, I had, I had this blown away thing, but now I'm just already back in my body. But if, when I die, then I will go back and really be there. And then, then when people are silent later, and I'll elaborate that more when we get to that ninth chapter. Well, I'm not doing that. I did that in the Mimla But in the later chapter, he, in a non-dual way, was focused on all of other all the beings there with him. He didn't have to go off into a separate state to feel good. He feels so good himself 
in the non-dual nirvana of nirvana samsara non-dual, that he sees other beings also as also all right. He empathizes that, with them, knowing therefore that they don't feel that way, because he feels one with them. So as he has that bliss state experience without being separated from other beings. So when he's silent, he's a, he's kind of not pointing to any other place. He's just simply not giving them a moment of peace, not having them run after what he might say, so they will feel their their all rightness in the ultimate reality of nirvana, samsara, non-dual. So they'll touch their inner heart core sense of relationality to everything good, to clear light of the void or whatever, you know, the freedom, clear light of freedom. So therefore his silence was liberating and, and Shariputra's silence by pointing to something that he felt people didn't have in their normal state. He was taking, he was, uh, he was uh, depriving them actually because everybody has a sense of being connected infinitely and being there kind of, you know, and being all right in their heart, you know, unless they're really depressed or in a kind of hell. But even, in, 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 and actually it's very challenging, Bhimakirti's vision is that even being in hell has created a structure around their well-being state, their Buddha nature, which is the open state their openness of them as a continuum, their ability to be a continuum, to have a heartbeat, to have a whatever kind of heart it is in those kind of embodiments, horrific embodiments. So that is what, this is why, so because of what she says, this is why realistic speech, the beginning of the super education in ethics, is actually the guiding energy of all education in non-duality, which also transcends the duality between the pair, duality and non-duality, not by merely avoiding duality through a dualistic silence. <laughs> okay, Bing, so that's enough today in this session, and um, um, we'll stop there partway through this, and we'll pick up again from page 58. The heading here is Speech as Essential to Learning, the mainspring of wakeful ethics. I like wakeful rather than mindful. I like wakeful because, you know, I'm presenting in this book, you know, the right way of being, which includes mindfulness, but wakefulness is more than sort of watching things. Wakefulness is like lucid dreaming. You know, you know, in a dream, you're not only in a dream, and then when you wake up for a moment, you know you're in a dream just as you're losing it, and you only know you are in a dream by losing it, right? So you know, oh, I had that dream. When I was in the dream, I didn't know I was in a dream. Okay? But, you know, in a way, what, I'm, what, what, what the Buddha says is our normal way of being, we are just sort of distracted with our processes, and we're going to get over here and do that and learn the other and think this and think that. And we're sort of sleepwalking through things. We're in a mental continuum of thinking our way through, and now we're over here, where is that, what is going on? And we're not really fully present to the full richness of the moment that we're in. So in a way, we don't, we're not lucid in our awakeness. So what we need is lucid awakening, as well as lucid dreaming, as well as lucid sleeping. That was enlightened state is where everything is lucid. And what do we mean by lucid in the dream? You're still in the dream, but you know it's a dream. So you're more free in your reactions in the dream. When you don't know it's a dream, you're kind of a little bit victim of your emotions, passions, things that frighten you, things that attract you, things that puzzle you, things that depress you or oppress you. And you know, you don't you you you're not free in the sense that when you're lucid in a dream, Oh, this is scary looking, but actually can't hurt, hurt me. Big monster runs at you because it's my figment of my imagination. I'm just dreaming, right? That's to be lucidly dreaming. That's the freedom of lucid dreaming in a dream. Wonderful story that my friend Dr. Nita tells, which I'll end the day on this light note. Uh, Dr. Nita tells the story of a man who 
had nightmares that were so, of being chased by a monster that were so bad that he would wake up sweating, dripping with sweat, terrified, screaming sometimes in his sleep and then waking up feeling desperate to get away. And he got to where he was scared to fall asleep, so he got became insomniac. He was getting sicker and sicker. So he went to different advisors and doctors and different people, and they gave him different pills and things, but nothing worked. And finally he went to some old wise sage, somebody, and that guy said to him, although we would also say that, even though we're not that wise, but we know that the other guy did. And he said, look, nothing external will help you. What you have to do is you have to try to make yourself a little bit lucid in your dream and pre-program yourself that when you're being chased, you're going to turn and face that monster. Whatever will happen, you have to face it. You, you, it's endless chasing you because you always keep running away. You have to turn and face it in the dream itself. That's the only way you'll ever be free of this terror and this sickness. So he tried and tried. And he, you know, he was really tough. But finally, he did it. So then, this one dream, he's ready. He works his way up. Monsters after him. He's running away. Then he's okay. He remembers. He pre-programmed. Okay, I'm going to face him. So he whirls around in the dream, and he stands up, full height, and he says to the monster, "Like, what is this? Why are you always chasing me in my dreams?" And the monster says, "I don't know. It's your dream." <laughs> I really love that one. The monster was a figment of his imagination in the dream. Didn't have a motive in chasing him. He was chasing himself. I really like that. Okay. By the virtue of this, of this reading, this section, and expounding on it, elucidating it more, may we all quickly become wise and blissful so as to be able to help other beings become more wise and blissful and make them equal to us, not to get any advantage over them, to bring them into equal wisdom and blissfulness as with ourselves. That's how we dedicate the merit of any good thing we do. Okay? Thank you.